Well, thanks, Brother Mick, and good evening, brothers, sisters, young people, and friends. Well, what a subject we've got before us, and I'm sorry if the if the carbohydrate diet you just endured is going to slow you down, I won't be dancing on the platform like the last guy. This is a pretty standard sort of a presentation. <laughs> Someone had to say it. <laughs> well, the problem this evening is not what to say, but what not to say. Because when you think about what's happening in the Middle East at present, well, let, let, let's just think about it. We've got a civil, a civil war spiralling out, out of control in Syria. We've got Saudi Arabia down south, across the border in Yemen, doing battle with the Houthi rebels in there. Israel, of course, has got its usual problems in the Gaza and in the occupied territories. And then there's ISIS. And there wouldn't be too many insurgencies around the world, not just in the Middle East, but even around the world, where ISIS is not somehow involved by alliance or involved directly. For example, places like Nigeria, Boko Haram, have an alliance with ISIS, simply because ISIS is a Sunni uh, Muslim rebel group. Any other Sunni Muslim rebel group around the world, when they watch the success of the campaigns of ISIS, is inspired to hold hands with them and form an alliance with them. This is an emerging, enormously emerging problem in the world, and particularly in the Middle East. ISIS currently controls about one-third of Iraq. They've already moved into Syria. They're opening up fronts at present with Turkey and with Egypt. They are in the Sinai. In fact, I read last week they shot a missile at an Egyptian ship and hit it. They forged allies with rebels in Chechnya, in Libya, and as I say, in Nigeria. Jordan is busy arming the Bedouins in Syria and in Iraq in order to prevent themselves from being invaded by ISIS. Do you know, the thing that sets ISIS apart from all other insurgent groups is this. They're a state. I mean, they call themselves Islamic State because they are a state. What's the point? The point is they have their own infrastructure. They own land. They have infrastructure, I mean, like dams, like dams across rivers. They own infrastructure like oil wells. They have farms. They collect income tax from the 10 million people in Syria and in Iraq, which are currently under their control. And they sell oil as an export. They fund themselves, therefore. Now, they might collect donations from elsewhere, but they can fund themselves at a rate of millions and millions of dollars per day. This is not just like Hezbollah, for example. On the 29th of June last year, ISIS proclaimed itself a worldwide caliphate. And the caliph of ISIS, their leader, is a fellow who calls himself Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. That's not his real name. The word caliph means successor. And the first caliph was a successor to Muhammad. So when Muhammad died in 632 AD, after he founded Islam, his successor was caliph Abu Bakr. So this fella, who calls himself Abu Bakr as the caliph, is copying the very first caliph of Islam, who was the successor of Muhammad himself. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. What is al-Baghdadi? Well, al means the. He's Abu Bakr the Baghdadi. That means Abu Bakr from Baghdad. What's the point of that? Well, what this fellow wants to do is recreate Bag like, Bag like it once was. You see, at the height of the Abbasid Empire, now let's just roll things back. After Muhammad died, Islam was simply an Arabic religion. That is, in Saudi Arabia, where Muhammad used to live. Very, very quickly, over 100, 150 years, Islam shot off and took over, well, an area like the orange area you can see on the screen there. Through the Rashidun Caliphate, followed by the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, Caliphate, followed by the Abbasid Caliphate. By about 750-800 AD, Baghdad was the centre of the world. Forget about the Roman Empire, Baghdad was the centre of the world. Trade between east and west in, of, of the continent of Europe went through Baghdad. They had their house of wisdom in Baghdad and they were leading the world in mathematics, in science and in medicine. 
The population has now swelled to a million. In fact, depending on the historian you read, it's suggested by some that Baghdad was the first city in history to get to one million people. These are the golden days of the Islamic Empire. The 1001 Arabian Nights happened in Baghdad in about 750 AD. You know the stories of Aladdin and his lamp, of, of Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves, of Sinbad the Sailor. You see, they were running the world from Baghdad in the 8th century. So that's what al Baghdadi is trying to do. He wants a worldwide caliphate like, they, like there was in the glory days of Islam. That's the point. But despite that dream, despite the rhetoric, despite the violence that you see from these people, ISIS will be nothing more than a shooting star that will fly sky high like this and come and crashing down to the earth. Blaze for a moment and then be expunged on the ground. It's a sideshow. It's going to be destroyed. It will never become the worldwide caliphate that it pretends it wants to be. And when I say destroyed, I don't mean by Christ at his coming. I mean by Russia. Russia and her confederates from Western Europe, the two legs, if you like, of the old Roman Empire, will destroy ISIS because they are the ones that are going to form the next world empire, not ISIS. Abu Bakr thinks he's a latter-day Assyrian because he controls Mosul. Mosul is the second city in uh, Iraq, and it's on, well, just across the, the uh, Tigris River from Nineveh. So you can see the ruins of ancient Nineveh from Mosul. He's running around pointing the gun at weak governments and at large civilian populations, taking territory in a voracious manner. But you know what? When the real lad Assyrian comes in the land, it'll make ISIS look like a, a, a Sunday school picnic, really. ISIS won't stand a chance. They won't know what's hit them. And as for brutality, he will be completely outclassed by the northern force that comes down upon him. What we're seeing play out in the Middle East before us right now, in fact, is a titanic struggle between ancient powers. ISIS, as you can see, wants to re-establish the Abbasid Caliphate of 750 AD. Iran wants to re-establish the Achmenid Empire, that's Cyrus's empire, of 450 BC. So I said Iraq, I mean Iran, the Persians. They want to recreate the Persian Empire. Russia wants to re-establish the Byzantine Empire of 500 AD, the eastern arm of the old Roman Empire. And they all want to do that in the same territory at the same time. Can you see a problem with that? And guess who's in the middle? Turkey. Turkey. Everybody wants Turkey. Only one of them can win. And only the Bible tells us exactly what's going to happen. Come back with me to Daniel chapter 2. Now I'm, going to look, I'm not going to look at a lot of verses this evening, but I'm going to develop some strong concepts from Daniel chapter 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel chapter 11. These are the three chapters that particularly speak about the issues that are happening before us. And you, know, you've, you, you need a bit of a foundation in these things to really appreciate what must happen and, for example, what must not happen. So Daniel chapter 2. We're all very familiar with Nebuchadnezzar's image of Daniel chapter 2. But there are four major world empires, all of which we call successive divisions of the kingdom of men, and then there's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So four empires and then the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's the first point to make. Because the fifth empire here, for example, so we have uh, head of gold, chest of arms and silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and then this fifth empire, an empire of iron and clay, is in fact the restored Roman Empire. It's not a new empire, it's just a, a resurrection of an empire that has already existed. Because of course... Uh, the iron exists in the legs and the iron exists in the feet. So it's just Rome again. And then, of course, the kingdom of God. We know we're right on that, by the way, because when you compare it with Daniel chapter 7, which is the companion chapter from God's point of view, there are only four beasts and then the kingdom of God. Why am I labouring the point? For this simple reason. We are not, as far as prophecy is concerned, 
We are not expecting the emergence of an Islamic world empire. If we were to do so, we should have expected a fifth beast. We don't see a fifth beast, you see, so what we're expecting to see is a resurrection of the Roman Empire to confront the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns, and therefore, I'm sorry, ISIS is wrong. They will be a shooting star. They will be expunged, but they may well bring about the resurrection of the Roman Empire, but they will never become the caliphate that they, in fact, aspire to. Daniel's very clear. Four empires and then the kingdom of God. But there's a critical point to observe, and look at it in Daniel 2, verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, becomes like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and is blown away by the wind. Now, how does that work? The metals, the component metals of the image of Daniel 2 are broken in pieces together. How can that be when, as we've just said, that these empires were successive divisions of the kingdom of men? They didn't all exist together, so how can they be broken in pieces together? You know, the, the Persians overthrew the Babylonians. How can you break Persia and Babylon together there because Persia already broke Babylon? Well, you might say that the disposition or the culture or the religion of uh, the prior empires was passed on into subsequent empires. And that's partly true. Because, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity, which became common in the Roman Empire eventually, is a doctrine that was invented in Babylon. So there is some truth to the fact that the religion of early empires percolated its way through the successive divisions of the kingdom of men. You might say that the wealth of the empires was inherited by subsequent empires. Definitely true. Of course, when they took each other over, they also... Uh, confiscated the bank accounts. Our most common interpretation or uh, application of that verse, however, is that for, in order for the image to be broken to pieces together, we would expect to see the combined territory of all of those empires assembled together and destroyed together. So what we're saying is in order for Persia, Babylon, Greece and Rome to be broken in pieces together, what we expect to see is a resurrection of the Roman Empire in the last days occupying the combined territory of all previous empires, standing on two legs as the image arises over the mountains of Israel to be destroyed. But there's a problem here. Here's Babylon. You can see the area that Babylon occupied. Persia takes over, and you'll appreciate that the area of the Babylonian Empire was in here. Greece takes over and pretty much confiscates the entire area of the Persian Empire in here. Rome takes over and doesn't take all of Greece. If I go back one slide, there was Greece all the way up. You know, Alexander the Great took his campaign to the Indus River in the Punjab. The Roman Empire finishes here in Jordan a little bit into Babylonia, but clearly, clearly does not take all the, imp all the territory of the previous Greek empire. In fact, you know, Rome was divinely stopped from taking that particular area. Remember this story? Beware the Ides of March. What happened on the Ides of March? The Ides of March was a particular period of time in the month of March. I, from memory, I think it was between the 6th and the 15th. The, the Romans had a strange way of splitting the month into, into different portions. And in this approximately 10-day period of March, Julius Caesar in 44 BC was warned, I mean, there were various spectres on the horizon that might have resulted in his premature decease, he was warned to beware lest he doesn't make it out of the Ides of March. And he's reputed to have said on the last day, the 15th, that, that to the woman who said that to him, aha, we're at the end of the Ides of March. And she says, but we're not at the end. Of the, well, of course, it was the 15th of March in 44 BC that his assassins came upon him. And, and the point about that, you see, is that there was a certain urgency about the assassination of Julius Caesar. They had to do it then. Why did they have to do it then? Well, because on the 18th of March, Julius Caesar was leaving Rome to begin the Parthian campaign. 
He was going to take all that area, that eastern area of the Greek Empire that the Romans had hitherto failed to capture. But God said no. And so he dies three days before leaving town. Rome never ever did take what this part here is in fact called the, if you like, the old Seleucid Empire. It never ever really did take the Seleucid portion of the Greek Empire that it overthrew. Trajan in AD 115 in fact did go into Parthia. He captured the, cap the capital city which was Tessaphon. He held it for a year or two. Trajan died in 117 AD. Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian took over. He gave it all away and said, forget it, it's too hard, and withdrew the border back to Jordan. They never took and certainly never kept that portion of the Greek Empire that they overthrew. So it's not true, you see. It's not true that every empire took all the territory of the previous empire and then some. Because Rome never succeeded in doing that. But here's the interesting point. Now come to Daniel chapter 7. Because though Rome didn't achieve it in the 1st century BC or the 1st or 2nd century AD, she will do it yet. Daniel chapter 7 verse 7. Look at this. So we have four beasts, as you know, in Daniel chapter 7. Verse 4, the lion. Verse 5, the bear. Verse 6, the leopard. Verse 7, the great and dreadful fourth beast. And these are the four divisions of the kingdom of men. Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome. So we're talking about the Roman Empire in verse 7 of Daniel 7. After this I saw in the night vision, says Daniel, Behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. He had great iron teeth and he devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. Well what did he devour and break in pieces? Well, the Greek Empire, of course, the empire he overthrew. What did he stamp with his feet? What was the residue that he stamped with his feet? Well, of course, the Greek Empire. But he didn't, did he? He didn't stamp it with his feet because he never took the entire Greek Empire. Uh, but he will. He will yet stamp the Greek Empire with his feet. And we are waiting, you see, for Rome to capture the residue of the Greek Empire. To do what Caesar, Julius Caesar failed to do. To do what Emperor Trajan failed to do. To conquer the Seleucid Empire. That division of the Greek Empire rolling all the way out into Babylonia. That is Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. That division of the Greek Empire that he has never yet taken. He will one day take the residue of the Greek Empire and stamp it to death. And that's the story of Daniel chapter 11. You see, now, not, Don't go there just yet because I want to make another point about Daniel 7. But that's the story of the Roman Empire that's explained in Daniel chapter 11, which was our reading. Now, another observation on Daniel 7. Look at verse 7 again. <clears throat> what does he stamp this residue with? What does he use to break in pieces? Well, it says, there was in the night visions a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. He had great iron teeth, and with those teeth he devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue. So he's got great iron teeth. And we have an additional detail told us in verse 19 of Daniel chapter 7. Then I would know, Daniel says, the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, Exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue. So not only does he have iron teeth, he's got brazen claws. Now what would you make of that? I mean, how can you have an empire, a Roman empire of all, that, that's an empire of iron and an empire of brass? You will remember from Daniel chapter 2, that the Greek Empire was the Brazen Empire and the Roman Empire was the Iron Empire. So what do you make of the fact, therefore, that the Roman beast in Daniel chapter 7 is a beast comprised of iron and brass? Well, the point is, you see, when Constantine finally became sole emperor of the Roman Empire in 324 AD, he moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople. He did that in 330 AD. He did it for good reasons. And the good reasons were military reasons. Constantinople is, 
is a city that's built on a peninsula. And there's water to the north, water to the east, ocean I mean, and water to the south. And so the, uh, the only major defence that Constantinople has to have is what became known as the Theodosian Wall, ultimately fortified by Emperor Theodosius in the 5th century on the western side. 96 guard towers which have um, trebuchets and so forth in them. That became the fortification on the western... The point is that Constantinople was an impregnable city from a military point of view. That is why Constantine chose it. In fact, I think Constantine was actually born in Bosnia. So this is his hunting ground, really. He knew all about the geography of this place. And he knew that Constantinople would succeed very well as a military capital in the east. Not only that, but of course it was more central in the Roman Empire. If you had to send the army left or right, east or west, to deal with any problem, you might as well have your capital and the bulk of the army in the east at Constantinople, rather than over there in the west at Rome. Well, what's the point then about the iron and the brass? Well, can you see in the purple here, this is the Eastern Roman Empire. So this is the portion of the Roman Empire that subsequently became controlled from Constantinople. In the red in the west is the portion of the empire which was largely controlled from Rome. And there was a division between the East and the West over time. I mean, Rome and the West fell in 476 AD to the barbarians of Western Europe. Yet the East, run by Constantinople, continued on for another thousand years. But can you see that this really is the empire of Greece? Apart from the fact that we haven't yet taken this part in Mesopotamia, the old Seleucid portion of the Greek Empire, what you look, I mean, Greece, the Greek Empire never extended west of Greece. Well, that's the brass, and that's the iron of Daniel chapter 7, you see. The Roman Empire gobbled up most of the Greek Empire, and then some, and added the entire Western arm. Daniel chapter 2 represents Rome as an empire of two legs. Why two legs? Well, because, of course, there are two capitals in the Roman Empire, one in the West and one in the East. And it's this fourth empire, the Empire of Rome, which in verse 11 of Daniel chapter 7 is the empire that confronts the Lord Jesus Christ at his return. I beheld, then he says in verse 11, because of the voice of the, of the great words which the little horn spoke, you'll read about the horn speaking in verse 8 of this chapter, I beheld till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So we have the, the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7, if you like, thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation 19 and verse 20 at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So very simple. What we clearly expect to see then is not only a resurrection of the, of the Roman Empire, but a resurrection of the Roman Empire in two halves, an eastern half and a western half. And these two capitals, these two ancient capitals, the city of Rome and the city of Constantinople, holding hands, united well, what does Daniel chapter 2 say? This empire will stand on the basis of the strength of the iron. The only vestige of the iron of Rome that still exists today is Roman religion, the Catholic Church. So we would expect to see Catholicism being the glue that joins Rome and Constantinople together for a latter-day resurrection of the ancient Roman Empire. Easy. And that empire will be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes, says verse 11 of Daniel chapter 7. Now come to Daniel 11. What happens in Daniel chapter 11? Well, in Daniel chapter 11, you've got the detail about the resurrection of the ancient Roman Empire. Now let me just show you a little bit about this chapter. I'm just going to read with you verses 1 to 4, and then we're going to jump straight to verse 40 and pretty much forget the rest. But you'll see why. Verse 1 of Daniel chapter 11. Also, he says, In the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. The first year of Darius the Mede was about 538 BC. Daniel is receiving this prophecy whilst he's in Persia, just a short while before he died. And now I will show thee the truth, he says. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. 
they're going to stand up yet three kings. Well, Darius the Mede, that you read of in verse 1, was in fact co-regent with his son-in-law Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, the Cyrus that we heard about in our last talk. Well, that was the first king. Those two were co-regent. There's the first king. The second king was Cambyses, or the, the first additional king, yet three kings in verse 2, the first of which was Cambyses, the second Smyrtus, the third Darius, Hystaspes, and the fourth king, which would be far richer than they all, was King Xerxes of Persia, the greatest king of the Persian Empire. And you see, in 480 BC, he attacked Athens. He attacked Greece, and he sacked Athens and razed it to the ground. That so infuriated the Greeks that they forever after that swore to avenge their loss, that loss they had suffered at the hand of the Persians. Well, well, as far as Daniel chapter 11 is concerned, all the rest of the histories are relevant until you come to the Greek king of verse 3 of Daniel chapter 11. A mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Now, I'm saying this is a Greek king. In fact, this is a reference to Alexander the Great, the first king of Greece. Now, how do we know that from verse 3? We'll look at verse 4. And when he shall stand up, that is when he, the mighty king of verse 3, shall stand up, when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. <coughs> it shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. Alexander, of course, was a young man when he died, about 32 years old. 10,000 miles, you know, after a campaign of 10,000 miles and a duration of 10 years, he took the entire Persian Empire. But he would never live to govern that empire. It was taken by others. In fact, it was taken by four generals. I mean, it began as six. They whittled down to five. They eventually became four. And these are the four divisions of the Greek empire. Cassander, you can see here, ruled Greece. Lysimachus ruled Thrace. Seleucus ruled Syria and all the way down into Babylonia. And... Ptolemy Sota ruled Egypt. They were the four divisions of the Greek Empire. So you see, in Daniel chapter 7, you read of a leopard with four heads and four wings. In Daniel chapter 11 and verse 4, you read of the four winds of heaven that this, this empire would be divided amongst. This is the Greek Empire. And of these four divisions of the Greek Empire, only two are important in the context of Daniel chapter 11. Daniel calls them the king of the north... And the king of the south. Seleucus Nicator became the king of the north. That is the first, after Alexander's death, the first king of that territory you see in yellow. And Ptolemy Soda became the first king of the south. North and south with relation to Israel. And you notice the maps try to be included detail here. Look, at the, look what's happened to Israel. Sometimes it was control of the king of the south. And sometimes it was in control of the king of the north. And the king of the north and south waged war against each other over the territory of Israel. That's why these two kings, as far as Daniel is concerned, are the only significant features of an empire which in fact had four kings. And you read in verse 5, the king of the south should be strong. And off it goes and describes the war between verse 5 and 35, the the, the 150 odd years war between the king of the north and the king of the south. Now come to verse 36. Because when you get to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 36, you have a change. A major change. In verse 36 it tells you that the king shall do according to his will and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Which king? The king of the north or the king of the south? Neither. Just the king. What's it telling you in verse 36? Well, the Roman Empire has taken over. And Rome, of course, ruled all of this region under one king who lived where? There. At Constantinople. You'll see the little word, Byzantium. Byzantium. One king ruled all four divisions of what was the Greek Empire. Oh, yes, yes, we haven't got to it yet. He didn't take, didn't take all this land here. We'll come to that later. But you can see, one king, and therefore the king, is the Roman king 
The king who lives in Constantinople is the king, in fact, who now controls the area of the king of the north and the area of the king of the south, and he is a Roman king. So there's the... How do I do this? I've broken it. <laughs> oh, I've broken everything. Help me. Yep, yeah, that's... Battery? What did you do to it, Steve? I don't know. There was a plan. Oh. Keep talking there, I'll you. Okay. <laughs> what, what shall I say now? <laughs> okay, so there's the, the point is, you saw the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire was the purple section, now controlled by a king from Constantinople, the king of Daniel chapter 11 and verse 36. Well, time progresses. Rome in the West falls in 476 to the barbarians of, of Europe. Thank you very much. Let's see if he did anything good. He did. Rome in the West falls. In Eastern Europe, however, no one could take it. Constantinople was impregnable. Well, of course it was. It was the military capital. It was chosen for that specific reason that it was impregnable, you see. City built on a peninsula. Water on three sides. The Western Wall heavily fortified. And things would continue for the next thousand years just like that until 1453. Now, by 1453, you see, gunpowder had, had its made, made its way into Europe from China. And in 1453, Constantinople fell to the Turks. And the siege is legendary, the siege of Constantinople. You can go and look at it on Wikipedia, you can read it. But by, by various means of attrition, uh, the, the uh, inhabitants of Constantinople were worn down until they had no choice but to surrender. In fact, it didn't come to a surrender these cannons, which were lined up against the walls, did enormous damage. But in fact, it was an open gate that let the Janissaries, the, the Turkish Janissaries in finally. They pretty much slit everybody's throat, and now they took the city of Constantinople. You've got to appreciate that there had been many tries by various Turkic hordes to take Constantinople. And by the time Constantinople fell, the Turkish Empire already, this is the Ottoman Turkish Empire, already extended all the way into Hungary. And Constantinople was like a little island in the middle that nobody could overthrow. And so they desperately wanted to get to Constantinople because well, you, you, know, you can't have an empire with the enemy ensconced right in the very centre in an impregnable fortress. So it was a very big deal when they finally overthrew Constantinople. But look what they found when they got there. I've done it again. The beautiful cathedral of Justinian, built in the 5th century by Emperor Justinian, the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. Now you notice a conspicuous feature of that, that cathedral that Justinian wouldn't have built. What would that be? The minarets. Even though it was a, a, a Catholic cathedral, it was so beautiful that the Turks thought they just couldn't destroy it. They'd better rebrand it and make it into a mosque. So they built minarets and then they put badges on it to make it into a Muslim cathedral, which they call a mosque, and it's still there today. Such was the glory of Justinian's cathedral. And the Ottoman Empire grew and grew. And it's taken over, as you can see, all of the west, the, the, the eastern Roman Empire. Constantinople's renamed Istanbul, all the way out, in fact to the gates of Vienna. And there's a story there, you know. What happened at the siege of Vienna? Well, the Turks, of course, want to, want to go all the way into the Holy Roman Empire, the Germanic Empire, which exists here. But they stopped because, of course, they come, they come in their siege in about 1560, 1580, against Vienna. And who was it? Who was it that saw the the little lights on the horizon of the Turkish army when they got up early in the morning to put the bread in the oven? Well, of course, it was the bakers. And they see this army in the distance, in the shadows, and these little flickerings of light, and they raise the alarm, and the Viennese army storms out the gate, and the Turks take to their heels and they run. And what did they leave behind? Their coffee. That's how Turkish coffee 
made its way into Western Europe. Well, who saved the day? Well, it wasn't the army, because there was no war. It was the bakers. Well, what do they do to celebrate that? Well, they bake a special loaf of bread. What do you think the flag looked like that the Turks flew under? A crescent. A crescent moon. So they bake a loaf of bread. What do they call it? Well, in French, the croissant. So coffee and croissants, you see, when you eat them together, it's a celebration of the victory of Vienna <laughs> and the salvation of the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> that ruined breakfast tomorrow morning, didn't it? <laughs> that's what happened. So that stopped the progress of the Muslim Empire further westward into Europe. Well, there's a problem now in Constantinople. This great fortress of Christianity has fallen to Islam in 1453. What do you think that did for the Christian population of Constantinople and the surrounding suburbs? Well, it meant things became very tough for them, didn't it? And they wondered what they should do. Well, of course, many of them just fled immediately, just migrated westward into Catholic Europe. What else could they do? Until one day, everything changed. You see, there's another fella who found his way into Western Europe in 1472, and he went there looking for a wife. Ivan the Great from Russia goes to Rome looking for a princess to marry. Well, lo and behold, Sophia Palaeologus, the, the niece of the last Byzantine emperor, that is the, the niece of the emperor from Constantinople, has herself found herself in Rome because, goodness me, there's no way she, as royalty, could ever stand and live in Constantinople and, and save her life, being a member of the royal family. And, and she's living with the Pope. And the Pope says to uh, Ivan, I've got a deal for you. I think you should marry Sophia. And secretly, you see, the Pope hoped that Sophia would take back Roman Catholicism to Russia. Well, the problem with that was that Sophia wasn't a Roman Catholic. She was a member of Eastern Orthodoxy, like, like a Greek Roman Catholic from the East. Well, she married Ivan, all right, but she didn't take Catholicism back. She took Orthodoxy back, and it became Russian Orthodoxy. But this was a turning point, you see, in world history, because now there are three Romes. Rome in the west, Rome in the east, and Rome in the north. It, no, I'll do, the, I'll do the, uh, what the last speaker did. Think about Daniel's image. Sorry, sorry for the camera. <laughs> Think about Daniel's image. We've got one foot on Rome in the west, and we've got one foot on Constantinople in the east. And Constantinople, Constantinople falls to the Turks, and this foot moves back like this to Moscow. Can you see, therefore... The Daniel's image has still got two legs, but the, 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 the left leg, as I made the point then, the left leg has changed location from Constantinople to Moscow. And that the day is going to come when that leg takes itself off Moscow and plants itself back on Constantinople. Could you see that being remotely likely from an historical point of view? Remotely likely when all the art, the culture, the learning, the philosophy of Constantinople immediately migrated to Moscow following their queen? Highly likely. Highly likely. So would you say Russia has an interest in Turkey? Would you say that, uh, from an historical point of view, Russia has uh, a military interest in overthrowing Turkey and removing the influence of Islam? You know, when... Uh, Constantinople, or Byzantium, migrated its culture and learning up to Moscow. It didn't just take the culture and learning, it also took the flag. This here is the, the coat of arms of the Russian Empire. The Russian Empire, in fact the Russian Federation today, also uses the double-headed eagle as its coat of arms, which it has inherited from the Byzantine Empire. That was the result of the, the Muslims, of the Ottoman Turks, taking over Byzantium and Ivan the Great marrying Sophia. Well, they build... Well, this is, this is what National Geographic said about that. Since claiming the Byzantine birthright, 
Russia has looked possessively, obsessively south. Now, what does it mean that Russia's got the Byzantine birthright? It means she was born in Byzantium. It means she was born in Constantinople. That's what it means, says National Geographic. Like the Greeks, Catherine the Great had her own great idea, a restored Byzantine empire in the Balkans, to be ruled over from a reconquered Constantinople by her grandson, Constantine. What do you make of the fact that Russians are calling their children names like Constantine? Would you think that the Russians see themselves as Romans? Eastern Romans, of course they do. She even hired, this is Catherine the Great, even hired John Paul Jones, a retired naval hero, unemployed naval hero, to command a Russian flotilla fighting in that cause in the Black Sea. Ironically, Russia came within a hair breadth of gaining Constantinople and the Straits, this is the Dardanelles, in, the, in, in World War I. The Allies promised to give Constantinople to Russia if they won World War I. Well, the Allies did World War, win World War I. The problem is that the Russian Revolution under uh, the Bolsheviks took Russia out of the war one year too soon. And Russia never got constant. If Russia had got Constantinople in 1918, she'd already be in Israel today, wouldn't she? But it never happened because angelically God said, whoa, too fast. And he gives them 70 or 80 years of, of communism and bankrupts them and puts them on pause only to find the Berlin Wall fall down in the west, uh, the, the, double, the hammer and sickle fall down in the east and Russia's back to the empire building status that she once occupied prior to the Bolshevik revolution. And this is how they build their cathedrals in Russia. Now, what is that on the top of that cathedral? Well, it's a cross. And what's under the cross? What do you suppose that means? One day, we go back and we take back Constantinople and we bury Islam. What else can it mean? Why else would you do that? And so things continue for another 450 years. So... The Turks have taken over. Ivan has married Sophia. He's taken her back to Moscow. The Russians have got a dream, but nothing happens. Oh, they try a Crimean War. They try another Crimean War. But the French and British empires are too powerful. And Russia, though she tries to come into Turkey, she can't quite manage it. She even tries invading Afghanistan. I'm not talking about in 1980. She tried twice before 1980, and she's rebuffed either. She's tried and tried and tried to come into the Middle East, but she can't quite make it, you see. And then history changes course again. For about 100 years prior to World War I, the Turkish Empire had been struggling. I mean, Turkey was called the sick man of Europe because, as you found, bits and pieces of Turkey's extremities keep dropping off. And the empire is shrinking. And, and, and it poses what everybody calls the Eastern question. When Turkey goes, who's going to occupy the void left by Turkey? Who's going to be the empire in the East when Turkey finally dies? Because die she will. Well, World War I begins. Russia and Britain both declare war on Germany. And now Turkey's caught. Because in the years prior to World War I, Russia had tried to attack Turkey. And Britain, remember the Light Brigade? Britain had helped Turkey against Russia. So now Turkey's got a problem. And the problem is, does she love Britain more than she hates Russia? And therefore she'll join the Allies. Or does she hate Russia more than she loves Britain? Because Britain and Russia are on the same side. Does she hate Russia more than she loves Britain? In which case, she'll join the Germans. She joined the Germans. That immediately makes Turkey an enemy of the British Empire. Britain attacks Turkey and fails terribly at Gallipoli. So what does Britain do? She retreats back to Egypt, which at that time was a British protectorate. She drives up Palestine and takes mile after mile after mile of territory off the Turkish Empire. And the Turkish Empire, as we found, dries up. So here's Britain. She tries to land here in the Dardanelles and fails. So she comes down here to Egypt and drives up the Palestinian coastline and takes all of that territory and dries up the, 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 the Ottoman Empire back to what we know today as Turkey. And do you want to see that in Bible prophecy? Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. At the time of the end, shall the king of the south put
push at him. Now, who's the king of the south? Because, as you'll recall, we've left the king of the north and the king of the south long behind. And by the time we get to verse 36 of Daniel 11, we're just talking about the king, the Romans. But by the time you get to the 20th century, of course, the Roman Empire has fallen. And we're back to the king of the north and the king of the south in verse 40. Well, who's the king of the south? Well, the king of the south was this ancient Ptolemaic Empire, this fourth division of the Greek Empire. In short, the king of the south is a foreign occupier in control of Egypt. You want to see the proof of that? Look at verse 43, or verse 42. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Why doesn't it say the land of the king of the south shall not escape? Why does it say the land of Egypt shall not escape? Well, because, you see, the king of the south is Egypt under the control of a foreign power. In 1956, Britain left Egypt and Egypt became an independent. She, became, she had self-determination. She just became Egypt again. So the Egypt that you read of in verse 42 is Egypt governing itself. The king of the south you read of in verse 40 is Egypt under the control of a foreign power. In this case, not the Ptolemaic Empire of Greece, but the British Empire. And the British Empire, verse 40, pushed at him. Who's the him? Well, the him. Well, look at verse 40. You'll see the word him. Verse 39. He, he, he. All the way back to verse 36. The king shall do according to his will. The him of verse 40 is the king of verse 36. The him of verse 40 is Constantinople. What happened in World War I? Britain went from Egypt and pushed at Constantinople and dried up a good portion of the Ottoman Empire. Well, then what happens in verse 40? And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Well, you see, that hasn't happened. We're sitting right now on the colon of verse 40. The king of the south, Egypt under the control of a foreign power, has pushed at Turkey or at the Turkish Empire and dried her back up to Turkey. We are waiting for the day when the king of the north... Now, who would the king of the north be? Well, he would be the foreign power in control of all this territory here. Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. The ancient area of the Greek Seleucid Empire. That area there that I just showed you, under the control of a foreign power is the king of the north. So that area is going to be con com come under the control of a foreign power, and then it is going to push at Turkey. There it is, perhaps, more clearly. Here's the, king of the area of the king of the north. That area has got to fall to a foreign power. Well, who will the before it pushes at Turkey, who will the foreign power be? Well, you know, we know, because we compare Daniel chapter 11 with Ezekiel chapter 38, and we say, well, how about that? Daniel 11 and Ezekiel 38 speak about the same geographic origin, the same hostile intention to invade Israel, the same time period of the conquest, be it the time of the end or the latter days, the same choice of military vassals, Libya and Ethiopia are both mentioned in both chapters, the nature of a sudden interruption, the coming of Christ, and the ultimate defeat of Gog upon the mountains of Israel. Daniel 11 and Ezekiel 38 are talking about the same battle. But Gog in Ezekiel 38 is presented as the latter-day Assyrian, whereas in Daniel chapter 11 he's presented as the latter-day Greek. That's the difference you see between these two chapters. What should we expect to happen then? Well, what we must expect to see is that Russia, by fair means or foul, is going to find herself in control of the ancient Seleucid Empire. And having got control of that empire, then she's going to invade Turkey because Russia will attack Turkey after she has become the king of the north. That's what Daniel 11 verse 40 says. So Russia takes this area here, then she attacks Turkey, and then she comes down through Palestine into Egypt and then back to Jerusalem to plant the tabernacle of her palace between the two seas in the glorious holy mountain, as Daniel says. So there's the blueprint for Armageddon. At which time, of course, Christ appears, having judged the household and destroys Gog upon the mountains of Israel. That's the story of Daniel chapter 2, 7 and 11. 
That's what the future holds. Now, let me show you something else. So Britain goes and she dries up Turkey, or the Turkish Empire, back to Turkey. And now Britain's in control of all this territory. Actually, Britain and France between them are in control of all this territory. And two gentlemen, Mr uh, Mark Sykes from Britain and Mr George Pico from France, sit around a table and decide between themselves how they're going to carve up the dead corpse of the Ottoman Empire and, and how they're going to make countries out of that and who gets what. <coughs> and the reputed conversation went something like, Pico turns to Sykes and says, you know, Mark, I should like to draw a line between the E of Acre and the K of Kirkuk. I'll take the north, you take the south. Because French influence is predominant here and British influence is predominant there. What do you say? Deal. I just about did it again. Deal. And between... These two, if you like, colonial powers, they carved up the Middle East. Here was the problem. Here's the border of Iraq today. No concern, no concern whatsoever for tribal, religious or ethnic boundaries. We have drawn arbitrary borders on countries in the Middle East after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. We have set the place up for an explosion. A hundred years ago, in 1916, a year or two before the war finished, that's what the French and the British did to the Middle East. Completely unsustainable and destined to fail. Absolutely destined to fail. Well, in the 1920s, Britain and France ruled that area with an iron fist. They were very powerful empires and they, they brutally enforced those borders. So it maintained control. By the 1950s, Abdel Nasser turns up in Egypt and he inspires the entire Arab world with the, with the prospect of a great Arab empire. And so the borders were tolerated. By the 1970s, dictators arose all through this region and ruthlessly suppressed any opposition in the population. So disputes, religious disputes, ethnic disputes, they were eliminated. And then it happened. Now, to think about it like this. Yugoslavia under Tito. So after the Second World War, very much the same thing happened in Yugoslavia. You get all these different ethnic groups and different religious populations, you stitch them together in one country called Yugoslavia. What happens when you take away the point of a gun from Yugoslavia? Civil war. Serbs, Croats, they go at it. Because you have Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy and Islam all combined in the melting pot and everybody wants to recreate their own, their own empire the borders being the greatest extent that the empire has ever been in history. Well, then it happens. And America gets involved. Bin Laden finally said, we've had enough of the sykes pico agreement. Look what you have done to us for 80 years since the First World War. It hasn't worked. And so Osama Bin Laden fires his jet planes at the biggest western target he can find, New York City. Well, it doesn't take long, does it? And George Bush immediately sends soldiers in. He goes straight to Afghanistan and then goes looking for weapons of mass disappearance in Iraq. <laughs> Almost found them, <laughs> but not quite. <laughs> and Bible students across the Brotherhood said, I don't believe it. We have just seen two of the big four nations destroyed from the ancient territory of the King of the North. How long can it be before Iran wants a bomb and Syria is, is found to be hiding Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and armies go in there too and take the whole place and all of a sudden we have resurrected the ancient King of the North and put her under the control of a foreign power. Well, that was back in 2003. Ten years went by. America doesn't attack anybody else. They try to extricate themselves from the problems they created in those two countries. And they decide that the remedy for the Middle East is to install a Western-style democracy 
in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, let me tell you, that will be an unmitigated disaster. In Iraq, if you install a Western-style democracy, well, think about what's what's happening in Iraq. Saddam Hussein and his Ba'ath Party were Sunni Muslims governing a country where the majority were Shiite Muslims. Those two branches of Islam don't like each other. And because of the character that Saddam Hussein had, he was able to control, control uprisings extremely effectively. And so as a minority, minority of the population, he controlled the Shiites in Iraq. What do you think is going to happen to Iraq when you introduce democracy? Well, of course, the government's got to change. And it's got to go from a Sunni government to a Shiite government because the majority of the population in Iraq are Shiites. Think about it like this. The blue are Sunni and the green are Shiite. The blue peas are Sunnis in government and the green peas are Shiites in government. What America had created after 2003 was a corridor of Shiite power. It was broken when Iraq, which is a Shiite country, was governed by a Sunni parliament. Parliament. No longer. We've got a corridor of Shiite power in the Middle East. What do you think that means to Iran? (gasps) We can reform an empire. Which empire shall it be? I know. The old Persian Empire. The Archimedes Empire of 450 BC. That's what Iran's trying to do. So she'll go and destroy ISIS. Of course she will, because ISIS is Sunni. She'll destroy anything. She'll fight proxy wars in Lebanon, in Yemen. She wants to percolate Shiite Islam throughout the Middle East in order to recreate an empire that she owned two and a half odd thousand years ago. That's what's happened as a consequence of a change in government in Iraq. And this al Maliki government in Iraq immediately goes and makes the Sunnis second-class citizens. So now the Shiites control the country. They make all the Sunnis second-class citizens. They've got a few scores to settle about what happened under the Saddam Hussein regime. The government troops are now ill-equipped to deal with uprisings because they don't want to keep killing their brothers. The Sunnis in Iraq, particularly in the north of Iraq, uprise against the Shiite government. A civil war begins. The government troops flee. What happens? ISIS takes over. As a Sunni insurgency in Iraq... They began to be called ISIS, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. They changed their name to ISIL, the the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. They have an aspiration to take the whole of Palestine. Now they're just called IS, Islamic State, because there is no restriction on their borders. And when they took the city of Mosul, let's go back, Mosul's here, uh, here, the second city of Iraq, Reuters tells me they inherited 2,300 Humvee armoured vehicles, at least 40 M1A1, this is Abrams tanks, modern US tanks, 74,000 machine guns, as many as 52 howitzer mobile gun systems, plus small arms and ammunition, and helicopters. So ISIS takes Mosul and immediately equips themselves as a modern army. The Americans gave these weapons to al Maliki to keep control of his country. He didn't know how to use them. Now ISIS have got them. Well, what do you think they're going to do? 2,300 hum- uh, Humvee... Ve- this is a quite a large army, and they can afford to buy more because they export oil. Where will this end, do you suppose? That's where they want it to end. This is ISIS's publication. That's the empire that they want to create, the Islamic Empire of 750 AD, with Baghdad at the centre. Can you see we have a problem in the Middle East? We've got the Sunnis wanting to create an empire which once existed, ISIS. We've got the Shiites, Iran, wanting to create an empire which once existed. We've got the Russians, Byzantium, wanting to recreate an empire which once existed all on the same land, all at the same time. That's a problem. 
And here's a bigger problem. Dear Mr. Putin, in a video, video obtained by Israel National News, an ISIS fighter at a Syrian military base that they took over warned Russia that they will liberate their lands. That is to say, ISIS is saying they will liberate Russian land. Vladimir Putin, these are the Russian planes that you sent to Bashar. So Russia, of course, is sponsoring uh, Bashar al-Assad so that he stays in power in Syria. Assad is linked to Shiite Islam which is the same as Iran. And Russia supports that particular brand of Islam. So Russia is against ISIS. She sends weapons into Syria to support the Assad regime. ISIS goes and captures those weapons and says, Putin, we're going to send it back to you. God willing, they say, we'll take these weapons back to your own turf and liberate Chechnya and the Caucasus. Your throne is being threatened by us, the militant said in a video dated August 31. This is, this is unmitigated folly. So here's ISIS saying to Putin, we're going to come and get you. We're after you, Mr. Putin. Well, I don't know about you, but all I see about Mr. Putin is that he would not be intimidated by that. He would probably be made angry. Not only that, they're going to attack Rome. Following the capture of... Oh, you read it for me. Gardavia Air, Air Base near Sirte in Libya on May 29. May 29 this year, the Islamic State has renewed its threat of attacks against the Italian capital by air. OK, so you tell me what would happen if Islamic State was to fly a commercial jet airliner 700 miles, about an hour and a half, 700 miles from Libya into the Vatican. That's what they want to do. And they publish their propaganda material, not in this picture, but in other pictures you can find, where there's an Islamic State flag flying on the top of the obelisk, the pillar, in St. Peter's Square. These idiots are threatening the two capitals of the Roman Empire. Moscow, you understand, we move the left leg of Daniel chapter 2. They're threatening Moscow. They're threatening Rome. Italy, you understand, is bearing the brunt of all the refugees fleeing from North Africa. Italy is the closest place for these people to get to on their boats. Italy's worried about the fact that they're not all refugees. They're mercenaries pretending to be refugees. And we bring them ashore and give them sanctuary in the EU. We're worried when we hear things like this about what they're really here for. Europe's got a problem. But what do they do? Let them drown in the water? There's children there. Well, it doesn't matter to ISIS. There's a goal here. And it's to create an empire which includes this area. And they say, we're coming after Moscow and we're coming after Rome. What's the consequence of that? Verse 40 of Daniel chapter 11. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, chariots, horsemen, many ships. He shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Can you see, therefore that ISIS, in fact, could be the very catalyst that brings Russia into the Middle East to take for itself the area of the King of the North. And how will he take that area? Daniel chapter 7 says, stamp the residue with his feet. He won't walk in and ask for control. He'll deal with it in the only way he knows how. And from there, take Turkey and then take the Holy Land. Unbelievable. I'll make one suggestion to you. As you just skim down, and I'm almost done, as you skim down the words of the, the verses of Daniel chapter 11, you'll notice in verse 40 that Turkey falls, the hymn. In verse 42 that Egypt falls. In verse 43 that Libya and Ethiopia, or the Sudan as it is, Libya and Ethiopia fall. Let me make a suggestion. As you read Daniel 11, it might just appear to you that that Russia is simply coming up against a list of countries who happen to be on the wrong side of the line at the time that she wants to make this invasion. In fact, the situation may well be that Russia came, comes against one enemy that happens to be located in the list of countries in Daniel chapter 11. You see the difference. This is not a haphazard invasion in Daniel chapter 11. Now let's, now let's be clear. I can't tell exactly how the war is going to play out. What appears to me, however, is 
I don't think ISIS is going away. I think they're a very big problem. I think they're very silly people. They're pointing guns in all the wrong directions. And the reprisal, the consequences of doing that, are likely to be severe, and they are the consequences of Daniel chapter 11. And this is significance for us, you see, because this leads to the Battle of Armageddon, which we know from Joel chapter 3 is the judgment of the nations. Daniel 12 verse 1 says, At that time, that is the time of the end of verse 40 of Daniel 11, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So at this very time we have the judgment of the Gentiles at Armageddon. We have the judgment of the household at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know about you, brothers, sisters, young people, but it doesn't appear to me as though we've got all that much time left. And I don't have any time left, so I'll just make one point. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 31 says, If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Judgment's coming for the Gentiles. Judgment's coming for the household. Now is the time for self-examination. Because Christ is coming.